day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I want to say that we are delighted that you are with us and worshiping with us on this morning. I know we're doing announcements from my office, but uh, we still want you to bear in mind those on our prayer list. Uh, that's Brother Mark Cuthbert, who is in California, uh, Sister Katrina Hall, Sister Mildred Miles, Irvin Thomas, Sister Ball, as well as her sister. And let us keep uh, Sister Eartha McKinney in your prayers. Uh, also, our sister Deanna Dudley uh, is traveling. She lost her grandfather. Her grandfather passed away, and so Deanna and her husband, Nicholas, are traveling, and their baby girl are traveling to, uh, to lay to rest her grandfather. So pray for Deanna Dudley, Nicholas Dudley, and Dudley as well, for traveling grace and for comfort concerning the passing of her grandfather. Let's pray for Sister Legina Dunbar. So as you know, we have made previous announcements for prayer uh, concerning her sister, but her sister did in fact pass away, and so we want to uh, extend our condolences to her and her family. So pray for Sister Legina Dunbar and the family back in Alabama concerning the passing of her sister. Pray for Richard Lee and uh, uh, Rudolph Jackson, um, talking with Richard and you know, some days are, are better than others, and it, and it's, it still hits him, the reality of that, that his mother isn't coming back. And so let's pray for Richard, and I know the same for Rudolph concerning the passing of his daughter. So let us pray for everyone in on our prayer list. I'm going to also ask that you pray for Barbara and I. Uh, we have been working tirelessly with others to try to make sure we get the building up to par so that you guys can get back into worship fellowship with one another so we are working with that we are working towards uh honing in on a date i don't want to spill it too soon but uh i know that you all are anticipating that so we are working tirelessly to uh to get the building uh where it it is it is best for you all safe and uh for you all to worship so pray for us for because we are going to take a much needed rest so continue to pray for all of those on our prayer list. Pray for Barbara and I. Pray for this ministry here at the Liberty City Church of Christ. I'm going to do things a little different. I'm going to pray now uh, before we have a closing prayer. I'm going to pray for those on our prayer list, and then we will go into our worship service. Heavenly Father, I want to say thank you, Father, for being such an awesome God. And I want to say thank you, Father, for your blessing of favor on our life. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will bless those on our prayer list with the comfort that they need concerning the passing of their loved one. Pray, Father, for the health and strength of those who are on our sick list, who are fighting various ailments and diseases and cancer. Dear God, I pray that you will uh, bless them, keep them, Father, and uh, give them the things that they stand in need of. Father, I pray that you bless with your mighty hand the favor upon this church. May we... Uh, get together and work together to do great things for the cause of Christ. And Father, bless our efforts as we prepare to open back up uh, for worship service. And for Father, we are anticipating what you're going to do next in our life. And we just thank you for everything that you are, all of what you are doing and what you will continue to do for your people. Father, we give you praise. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to say also... Uh, that we are going to uh, play a pre-recorded message, a sermon, an oldie but goodie, but I pray that you will enjoy it and that you will still be blessed. Still take notes for those who may not have taken notes, but we're going to, we're going to play the sermon uh, for this Sunday, The Paradox of the Christian Faith. I pray you enjoy it. Let's worship God together. All the glory belongs to you. All the glory belongs to you, oh God. Oh God, say all of the glory, all the glory belongs to you. All of the glory, all the glory belongs to you.
have come back to this place of worship, this building, really, but never are we from God's presence. And so it is incumbent upon us to make sure that where you are right now on the Lord's day, that your mind is still stayed on Jesus, that your mind and your heart is prepared to receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Well, if we move on, let us move on. I want us to look at a passage of scripture found in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and we will begin at verse number 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning at verse number 7. Paul says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels, so that the past, so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not ourselves. Persecuted, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not despairing. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be manifest in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. And so death works in us, but life in you. I want to talk to you from the subject this morning, the paradox of living the Christian faith. The paradox of living the Christian faith. Now, you know what a paradox is. A paradox is two contradictory statements, or it could be two contradictory statements of facts that go against one another, uh, of which uh, logic doesn't uh, resonate in such a statement. Well, Paul would often use paradoxes to get his point across by a literary device. And this device, he would use this paradox, uh, oftentimes Paul would say, uh, for me to live is Christ and for me to, uh, to die is gain. Or then Paul would say something like this to, uh, to the church at Rome, I beg you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Anytime you hear the word sacrifice, you know that a death took place. Well, how could you be living and a sacrifice at the same time? That's a paradox. And Paul often lived, he would say, uh, I was crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. How could I live and be dead at the same time? That's a paradox. Well, Paul uses this literary, literary device here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He will use it to combat those critics and those cynics who would attack his apostleship, who would suggest that he really isn't a true apostle because he makes uh, because he he he, uh, he distorts the gospel, or because of who he is physically, his gospel is mighty, his ministry is mighty, or he uses the preaching of the gospel for his own uh, aggrandizement. That he is he is selfish and he's using it uh, for his own satisfaction and gratification. Well, Paul will attack that because he will show, starting out in, in this letter. But chapter 4, rather, that uh, this ministry he received, he refuses to lose heart. Why? Because he understood the magnitude of that ministry and he understood the mercy that, received, that he received in order to carry him into that ministry. But then he would speak uh, boldly by showing that I, there is nothing that I hear from you. There is nothing that I've done that I've done in secret. I've de I, we have denounced the hidden things of secrecy. We have denounced Satan and all of his craftiness. And then he would say in his bold statement, as Paul would often do, he would say, "Then here's the other thing: if our gospel is hid, 
it is hid to them that are blind. For the God of this world has blinded the minds of men that they can't see. But then what is Paul driving at? He gets now to this part of the text and he says, for God, in verse 6, for God who said light shall shine out of darkness is one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, he, he sets in chapter 3, remember he talked about those uh, unbelieving folk who, because of unbelief, have a veil over their face. And whenever the law of Moses is read, that veil is still covering their face because of unbelief. Well, Paul says, the power is not in me, it is not in my speech, it is not in my status, this power is really in the fact that I have received a, a ministry to share with the world the glorious knowledge, the illuminating knowledge and power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now you may say, well, why is that important? Because when life uh, hits us with some things that we aren't really expecting, when we are in such a crisis as this, we need to know that it is really not about our own power and strength, but that it is about God's power that works in us so that we can still carry out, even in the midst of a crisis, the glorious illuminating light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, here's the first thing Paul wants us to know when it comes to the paradoxes of the Christian's life and him living that life of faith in Christ. The first thing he does is he declares the power of God. Now watch this. In verse 7 he says, but we have this earth and this treasure in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power may be of God and not ourselves. Now notice, he says we have this treasure in earthen vessels. What does Paul mean? You've got to understand how they view vessels or clays, jar or pot, clay pots in the first century. These particular vessels are pots of clay, they really were uh, invaluable to the Jewish eye. They were really cheap vessels. They were common. Everyone had them. They had them for everyday use. And so to the person hearing this, Paul would strike a chord because now he's saying there is a treasure in something that, that is deemed invaluable. There is a treasure placed in something that, uh, that has become common to man. There is a treasure God has put in this vessel. He says that the, the, the person in, the, in their homes or in the marketplace would throw away whenever they got tired of it, whenever it became useless or, or no use or whenever it became cracked. Uh, it, they would often throw it away, throw it in a field of crack pots and vessels. Paul says, but here's what you need to understand. He says, in all of what goes on in life, in all of uh, the, 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 the struggles and the pains of walking by faith with Christ, he says, we are crack pots at best. He declares the power by showing that you and I are nothing but clay pots. You and I are nothing but crack jars that to the world we are deemed invaluable. To the world we are deemed useless. Could you imagine, and some, some of you may be able to attest to this, that because of your past, because of what the decisions that you may have made, that in life you to the, to the person in your family, to your community, to uh, your, your neighbors, you may seem to them as worthless, Useless, you're broken, you are cracked at best, but Paul says you can be of good cheer because God has placed a treasure, something valuable, into the very thing that's cracked and broken. Amen. That is calm assurance of knowing that even in the, the midst of crisis, even in the midst of trials and tribulations, when we, get, when we get hit with things, when we become broken because of decisions 
And because of life's struggles, Paul says you can still put faith in God. It still will seem like a paradox to you because how could God take such brokenness, such, such meagerness, such uh, unattractiveness and place something of such great value in it? What Paul is declaring is the power of God and not of yourself. Watch it. He says, for uh, we have this treasure. Now, what's the treasure? Look at verse 6. Look at the latter part of verse 6. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. That's the treasure. The very fact that we carry about in us or with us the glorious light of Jesus Christ, who he is, how he comes to save man and develop a saved relationship with man. He says that's the treasure you and I carry. Notice, it isn't a bag of money. It isn't your 401k plan. It isn't, it isn't your retirement plan. It isn't the car you drive. It isn't the neighborhood you live in. Paul says the treasure you have is that you can share the good news of God with a blind world. He says, I declare this power. Come, come over to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And notice what Paul says in verse number 9. Paul says, he has said to me, now remember, Paul was taken up into the third heavens and he saw the vision that God had given them, given him rather. And when he comes down, God humbles him by giving Paul a thorn in the flesh. Now, Paul begs God to take away the thorn that he has now received that is designed to keep him humble. Now, Paul says in verse 9, my great, he, he, he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for, watch the word, my power, God's power is perfected in weakness. And most gladly, therefore, I would rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Now, why is that important? Because Paul, remember, he is under attack concerning his apostleship. He is under attack concerning his motives as an apostle. And Paul shows them, he, now, usually when a man is attacked, when his character is attacked, when his credentials are attacked, usually what, the, what that person does is they boast up and they start to, to give or hand out their resume. They start to let people know who they are and where they are, who they rub shoulders with. But Paul says, here's what I've chosen to do. I could easily tell you that I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. I could easily tell you that I was a Pharisee, that I kept the law blameless. I could easily tell you what my resume is. He said, but I seek not to do that. The very thing that I want to boast in and get across to you is my weakness. Amen. I'm weak at best, but what you see physically in me isn't really about me. I'm able to do what I do because of the power that works through me. Watch it. He says, my power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I'd rather boast about my weakness. Watch the purpose statement. So that the power of Christ may dwell in me. In order for you to, or to experience the power of God or the power of Christ in your life, you've got to first acknowledge and embrace your weakness. God cannot use a person that's stronger than he is or thinks that they're stronger than he is. You have to embrace and acknowledge you are weak. In, in other words, you are a cracked pot. Yes. It would do us good, even some of us as preachers and some of us as elders and, and deacons in the church. Instead of you greeting me as Dr. Fred, I need to really tell you I'm Minister Crackpot. Because I'm nothing in and of myself. Everything I am, who I am, how I preach, what I preach is all because God empowered me to do so. You are where you are. You are still living today because God's purpose is for you to take the glorious light of his dear son to a darkened 
and blind world. But watch it. He doesn't stop there. He says, therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, and with persecutions, and with difficulties. Why, Paul? For Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. But now, he doesn't mean the formula that we usually use, God's my weakness plus God's power equals my strength. No, no, no. What Paul is really saying here is my weakness plus God's power equals God's power. Because at the end of the day, you don't have any power. The only uh, thing you have is what God gives and works through you, and that's his power. Well, come back to our text. Come back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And here's what I, for those of you who may be taking notes, here's what I want you to understand. Here's what I want you to write down. The vessel's worth comes not from what the vessel is, but what it contains. The vessel's worth is not seen in what the vessel is in and of itself, but what the vessel holds. That's what gives it worth. Now, it also means that when God gives us a divine calling, he will always give us divine enablement. Remember that. Whenever God calls us for a greater purpose than ourselves, which is the spreading of the gospel, the sharing of the good news of Jesus Christ, whenever there's a divine calling, he will always give his people divine enablement. So, here's the other thing, and I've said it already, the power is not our own, but it is God's. And then keep in mind, God always gets glory in weaknesses. God can never get glory and we, are, we have taken the throne from him. God can never get glory and we have a haughty and high-minded spirit. God can never get glory if we're constantly uh, uh, relying on our own wisdom and our own strength. But God does get glory when you submit to him because of your weaknesses. God gets glory and then he empowers you with his power. But now, the other, and, and then the last point to that is, our weaknesses invites God's strength. So when you acknowledge that you are weak, when you acknowledge that you are a cracked pot at best, when you acknowledge that without God you are nothing, guess what it then does? It invites God's strength into your life. But now secondly, let's look at the paradox of power. We've looked at the declaration of power. Now let's look at the paradox of power. Look at verse number 8. Now, what Paul is going to do now, he declares the power. He, did, he, has, he has already stated now how he is able to carry out such a, a ministry of great magnitude. He's, he's now ready to explain to them what that looks like. And the, the way that looks concerning the Christian walk with God, it is seen as a paradox. It seems contradictory. Watch what Paul says in verse 8. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not despairing. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always, now, well, let me back up. Now, on, if, on your notebook, I want you to just simply draw a line right down the middle. And on the left side, I want you to put all of the negatives that are contradictory to the Christian faith. Here's the first one. Notice, he says, we are afflicted. It literally means to be pressed or squeezed. In other words, Paul is saying, another way of looking at it, Paul is saying, every day I am being squeezed, but I'm not squashed. Here's the next negative. I'm perplexed. Right? It's, it's, I'm, another way of looking at it, I'm bewildered. 
good, but I'm not be followed. Right? And Paul says, the, the, every day, this is the, the life that I live as an apostle. I'm being squeezed. I'm being pressed. I, he says, and then my mind can easily sway to the left side because I have no idea how I'm going to get out of this. But doesn't it sound like Paul when he told the Philippian church to pray and make your supplications known? And then that the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds. What does Paul say? Paul says, I may be bewildered. I may not understand how I'm going to get through the situation. We may not know when this crisis is going to end. We may not know how they're going to get a fix on this thing. But one thing we know is that it will not be follow us up to the point that we lose faith in the God who has control over the entire world. Watch it though. He says, he said, but now here's the next negative. We are persecuted. Are y'all seeing that? Now when he says persecuted, he literally means I'm being hunted down. I'm being chased. <laughs> oh, but well, watch this. But I'm not forsaken. In other words, there are some enemies after me. There are some enemies chasing me. Uh, but they can't get to me because there's someone with me. They, they are chasing me. They are hunting me down. But it's, they are, it is futile in their efforts because they can't get to me simply because there is someone with me. Didn't David say, I, I, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. It was Paul who said, if God be for us, nothing can stand against us. So here's Paul assuring the Christians that in the paradox of the Christian faith, you may be hunted down by your enemies. They'll never win. They'll never get to you. Life circumstances will never win and conquer you. Why? Because you have someone with you. Amen. Well, now let's read it again. Those are the negatives. So now here's what you need to put down the middle of it. But. Now. You're, you will be able to handle life's adversities. You will be able to walk with God by surety of faith. If you can determine which side of the but you're on. Yes. Now watch what Paul does. Let's read it again. He said we have this early uh, earthen treasure and earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not of ourselves. Now watch him. It's almost like Paul stands here today and he says, we are afflicted. He stands on the left side. But he says, a Christian quickly gets themselves on the right side of the butt. He says, we are afflicted, but, look at that, in every way, but, but not crushed. I'm perplexed, but I'm not destroyed. I'm not despairing. I'm persecuted, but I'm not forsaken. Always, I'm struck. Well, then he says, I'm struck down and not destroyed. He, Paul says, you got to determine if you want victory in your life, if you want to be victorious, you need to determine which side of the butt you're going to live on. And so many Christians fail at living a full and, and fruitful life with God because they spend more time on the left side of the butt than they do on the right side. They spend time, they're perplexed, they're afflicted, they're worried about being forsaken, they're worried about uh, 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 being your enemies, hunting you down, and you spend all of that time on the left side of the butt, and Paul is saying, but you need to get yourself back over on the right side. Look at that, look at that. But then, here's what I want you to write down. Here's what I want you to get. Our trials work for us, not against us. And then secondly, what Satan uses to hurt us always brings about the best in us. And then third, our weaknesses are the grounds for God's power. In other words, it is essential 
to have in our weaknesses, it is essential uh, that we recognize our weaknesses. Why? So that it can be the foundation and the ground for God's power. But watch this, watch this. Then last, he says, it's, and then here's what you need to remember. It's not the container carrying the content. It's the content that's carrying the container. <laughs> Let me say that again. It is not the the con the uh, the, uh, the the content the container, excuse me, that's carrying the content, but rather it's the content that's carrying the container. Hmm. Why? Because we're cracked pots. Hmm. At best, we are invaluable. Amen. At best, uh, without it, without God, we are useless. And so God gives us this power by placing this treasure in us and in our care and responsibility that as a result, it's the treasure, it's the glorious good news of God that keeps carrying us. Yeah. Watch this. Then last, look at the purpose of power. Look at the purpose. We've seen the declaration of power, the paradox of power, and now we come to the purpose of power. Look at verse 10. He says, we are always caring about in the body the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. What is Paul saying? Paul is saying, listen, we must not only identify with the death of Jesus, but we must also share in that death. And Paul, and, I, and the NASB uses the word correctly, he says we are dying. But now, he is using the Greek word thanatos, which means the success, the cessation of life. When soul is removed from body. He uses dying here in conjunction with the adversities he's just named. Affliction, right? Being forsaken, perplexed, being hunted down. He says that's the constant dying of the Christian. And then he uses, he, he helps us to see that even though we are dying just like Christ, he says, what gives us power is the same power that raised Jesus from the very dead. Yes. So here's what I want you to get. Jesus is my divine content. Amen. Isn't that right? Isn't that, yeah, and remember I told you, it's, the con it's not the container that's carrying the content, but it's the content that's carrying the container. And remember what Paul said? I quoted it to you early, earlier. Uh, uh, Paul says, I was crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but who? Christ that lives in me, and the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who gave himself for me. What is Paul saying? Christ is my content, and it is, and it is Christ who carries me. Yeah. It's Christ, church, who will carry us through this ordeal we're faced with now. It's Christ who will carry us through whatever we face now and in the future. Yes, Christ is our content, and it's the content that's carrying us to our heavenly destination. Amen. But then, understand this, I want you to write this down. Ministry that costs nothing accomplishes nothing. The minister, the preacher, the church, who, care, who claims to carry out ministry. If it doesn't cost you anything, it won't accomplish anything. You and I must sacrifice. You and I must be willing to die constantly. But then, I want you to, I want you to write this down. We die in order for others to live. Amen. Notice what he says in the text. Look at verse 11. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be all may be manifested in our mortal flesh. In other words, the more you die, the more you suffer, the more people can see Jesus in you. Amen. Not when you're living on your house on the hill 
and your burden on the lake. It is not when you have reached the pinnacle of worldly success that you see Jesus. No, Paul is saying it is when you suffer long, when you go through adversity, when you are beat up by life and its struggles, when your enemies constantly bombard your life and invade or try to invade your life. He says it is then that Jesus becomes the, uh, starts to come forward. And then last, watch this. Trials offer us the chance to carry Christ, not conceal Christ. Let me say that again. Trials offer us the chance, the Christian that is, to carry Christ with them, never to conceal it. But what has happened to us when we go through trials, when we go through hardships, we conceal Christ. When really we should be revealing Christ. Amen. Amen. Oh, church, it reminds me, and I may have told, I know the Liberty City family knows this already, but I'll tell those who may not be members of Liberty City. Let me tell you, when you're going through adversity, like Paul would suggest to us, you gotta, you got to see your life with Christ uh, the way Rocky did in Rocky chapter 4. I love Rocky Balboa. Boy, he was a fighter. And let me tell you about Rocky. Now, in Rocky chapter 4, he's at a bar. And at this bar, there's this old young up-and-coming fighter named Tommy. So Tommy hits one of the, the, the persons in Rocky's family. And Rocky looks at him and says, hey, Tommy, why don't you fight me? Why don't you beat, fight somebody like me? So they take it outside of the bar, and they get to fight. And Tommy is beating Rocky to a pole. And I'm telling you, he's getting the best of Rocky. He's hitting him. He's turning him every which way but loose. But then, Tommy hits him with one good solid right hand, and Rocky is laying there on the ground. And as Rocky lays there, he's, he starts to reflect back in his mind some of his previous battles. He remembers that old Russian that he had to fight. And as he laid there, Another picture comes into his mind. It was his trainer, Mickey. And all he kept hearing was this old trainer, Mickey, saying, Get up from there, Rocky. Get up from there. Get up from there. He kept hearing, but Rocky didn't move. Get up from there, you old bum. But Rocky doesn't move. But then, all of a sudden, Mickey says one last word. He says, Get up from there. Mickey loves you. And Rocky, he starts to get a little life. He starts to get up. And as he stands on his feet, he looks at Tommy. Tommy starts to walk off thinking he's won the fight. And, and he says, hey, Tommy, I ain't hear no bell. <laughs> and he starts fighting. And boy, he gets the best of Tommy to the point that he knocks Tommy out. Well, let me tell you, you need to look the devil and your adversities in the face and say, I ain't heard no bell. I may be perplexed. I may seem like I'm forsaken. I may seem like God ain't with me. I may, my enemies may be hunting me down, but I ain't heard no bell, and I'm going to stand because there's somebody greater with me. I'm going to fight. Oh, but I got to leave you with this last tidbit. Let me tell you, something else I found out in this rocky scene. When Mickey was talking to him, he saw him in a vision, right? But Mickey was dead. You know what else caused Mickey to get up? What else caused the other, what else, what, what caused Mickey to get up was not only because Mickey said, I love you, well, it was also because Rocky had come in contact with someone who had already died. Yeah. Let me tell you, you get power when you connect to the man Jesus who has already died. All right, now. Yeah. All right, make it clear. Make it clear. Yeah, he's all, and when you come in contact with Jesus, guess what? Life may knock you down, but because of his power, you'll get back up. Yeah, yeah. Friends may talk about you and laugh you to scorn because of your faith in Jesus, but you'll get back up. Yeah. Right? Your, your co-workers or your boss man may try to bury you so that you can't get the promotion that you've been seeking, but you won't get up. Yeah. Yeah. You know why? Because Jesus loves you. Amen. I want you to keep that in mind.
as you go through these adversities, hey, life will make us think. It, it, life will give us some paradoxes of the Christian faith. But one thing about the child of God, you can declare the power of God because it's not of yourself, but it's all because of God's power of, that makes you stand. You can, you, can, you can face the paradoxes of the Christian faith because you know that even though uh, the world may say you're forsaken, God is still with you. While the world may, may be perplexed because of adversities, you have a clear mind and a peace of mind yes. because of your relationship with Jesus. Oh, listen, you may be squeezed and pressed, but guess what? The power of God is going to create some space for you to breathe. Amen. So you keep that in mind. Oh, listen, I pray that what I've said to you has been, uh, has been uh, beneficial. But then lastly, remember, the power of God is also, or the purpose, the purpose of God's power is for you to make known the, that Jesus is alive and well. That's the purpose. And here's the other thing. It, let me say it this way. When it comes to the paradox of the Christian faith, it ain't about you. Mm -hmm. It's all about him who died for you. Amen. Amen. The paradox of the Christian faith. Declare his power. Declare that God is alive. Deal with those paradoxes that come, that come about in your life. And then understand the purpose of God's power. That you are to give life to someone else. What a blessing. I pray that there's someone who, uh, at the sound of my voice, you may be uh, wanting, even in this crisis, to give your life to the Lord. Well, guess what? You put faith in the Lord Jesus, who will cause you to stand again. Believe that he is the Son of God. Repent of your sins. Turn from this old wicked world. And say yes to Jesus by giving your life to him in immersion in, water, in the watery grave of baptism. I love you. I'll be praying for you. And I hope that you'll also be praying for us. That we get through this crisis together. And you have the strength that old Rocky has. Why? Because Jesus loves you.
Thank you. 